It should be coming on any minute. I can't believe I don't have your book out here, Renee. I want to get it. It's live on mine. It's live. It's live? Perfect. Okay. We're hoping the technology gods are working for us right now. And thank you all for being here. All right, ladies, do me a favor. When you are not on, can you please mute yourselves so that the speaker view comes up? Thank you so much. And um, so, hello, 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 Facebook world. Thank you to everyone who is here with us today. Um, we are so grateful and excited to be here with all of you. I am grateful to so many of you who have shared this live, uh, excuse me, that we were gonna be going live. Um, it is astounding to me. I've heard stories from all over this country, back and forth, about people who are coming live with us tonight. And I'm honored and grateful. Um, and obviously this is a point in time in our history where people are desiring to come together to have conversation and to convene about something extremely important. So thank you for being here. Um, I just have a couple of things that I want to go through. Um, first of all, I, I wanna thank these amazing women who have chosen to join me with this conversation tonight. I will introduce them to you shortly. Um, this is not my typical live. So if you follow me regularly on Facebook, um, you know that I um, usually do a lot of talking and answering people's comments. I'm going to try to do my best to manage both. So if you see me looking back and forth, I'm going to try to figure out how to do all of this at the same time. Um, and I'm new to this version of technology, so we'll see how it goes. Um, the second thing I want to say is that um, I will try to grab some of your comments for questions. But if not, we're hoping this is the first of many conversations that we will be hosting about this topic. Um, we're overwhelmed by the amount of interest there was in this conversation and so we're grateful. So with that all said, my name is Suzanne Goldstein. I am the founder of Dare Human. And here's what I believe. You were put here for a purpose, to be the best human you can be, to share your heart and your brilliance, to build societies and companies and things that are beneficial to all people and this amazing planet we inhabit, and to love as deeply and as kindly as possible. That is what I know to be true. And as we start this conversation, which oh, is so important and I'm so grateful we're having, um, I want to quote from one of my favorite poems, The Prayer of St. Francis. Um, he says, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. To me, there could not be truer words right now. And we have such a beautiful opportunity to bring ourselves together in this conversation. And so I want to introduce to you the three extraordinary women who are joining me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them. And I'm going to change us to this view so everybody can see them. Hopefully, you guys will change the view with me. I'm figuring this technology out as we go. Um, first, we have Renee Myers. Renee, if you could wave. Renee is the VP of Inclusion Strategy at Netflix. Prior to Netflix, she ran her own consulting firm focused on diversity, inclusion, unconscious bias, and anti-racism in the workplace. I had the great honor of being Renee's CEO for four years. And her TED talk about, about bias, which has over 2 million views, it should be required reading, and excuse me, required viewing for everyone in this country. And her book, What If I Say the Wrong Thing, should be required reading. So thank you, Renee. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, next, we have Malia Lazu. 
Malia, could you wave? Hi. Malia is the Regional President and Chief Experience and Culture Officer at Berkshire Bank, where she is creating innovative banking programs to make banking accessible to underbanked and unbanked black and brown people. Malia is a community organizer who has built programs to increase voter turnout, retrain and relaunch gang members, engage employees in implicit bias scavenger hunts, and launched more than 20 minority owned businesses through her Accelerate Boston program. I've had the great honor of working with Malia as well together over the years. And we're also part of a coalition of people that are trying to heal the urban rural divide in our country by doing adult exchange programs. Lastly, we have Debbie Irving. Um, Debbie is a racial justice educator and an author who works with other white people to transform confusion into curiosity and anxiety into action. Her book, Waking Up White, follows her, quote, sometimes cringeworthy struggle to understand racism. Prior to writing her book, she was a general manager of Boston Dance Umbrella, as well as Boston's first night celebration. And she was a classroom teacher in both the public and private schools. So here's what I am hoping for tonight and what we are all hoping for tonight. We are hoping that this is the first of a series of discussions aimed at providing context, content, suggestions to elevate your curiosity and desire to engage in being part of the solution. That you walk away with a couple of things that you can do to elevate your personal circumstances because we are all different people with all different backgrounds and cultures and that you have takeaways of some things that you can start doing immediately. Lastly, I wanna give a couple of rules of engagement. Um, this is a public forum. We chose to do it this way publicly and I'm grateful that there are 176 of you watching on the Facebook Live right now. It is astounding to me. Um, what I ask is the following. One, no hate speech, no hateful comments. If you don't like what we're talking about, please turn off the stream. We're not for you. We're not here to try to convince people to learn and grow. We're here for people who are interested in le learning and growing to come and learn and grow with us. So if you see someone posting a hateful or inappropriate comment on the Facebook page, I want to ask a huge favor of you. And please, I want to see those hearts fly right now. If you see hateful speech, please ignore it. Please do not feed the flame. Please do not try to interrupt that person. Please do not try to tell them they're wrong. It will not be a good use of your time or my time or anybody's time. Because as in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., the only way to stamp out darkness is with light. So we are not going to add darkness to that conversation. We are going to continue to add light. Lastly, in preparation for this conversation, I wanna tell you some words that you're gonna hear that you might not be comfortable hearing. And you're gonna hear some definitions of these words, but I want you to try to hear these with an open ear, an open heart and an open mind. And the reason for this is that for some of you, these words might be words that you've never heard in this context before, you've heard it in different contexts. And so we're gonna to try to highlight and illustrate some of that tonight. One of the words is white supremacy. One of the words is anti-racism. One of the words is white privilege. One of these words is unconscious bias. And there's gonna be a lot more. So I want you to prepare your ears, prepare your hearts, prepare your minds to be open. And before I turn it over to Malia, who's gonna be our first speaker, I would like to ask Brene to lead us in a moment of meditative thought about the lives lost during this difficult time. So Renee, if you could unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm so thrilled to be here and with everybody. I love that prayer by St. Francis Assisi. It's, it's something to remind us to really try during this time because it's not easy. But I'm just going to invite all of us, so whatever you do to get in your quiet meditative space, whether it's closing your eyes or um, bowing your head or just looking straight forward. Um, 
and I just want to give thanks. Thanks that we are here. Thanks that we are able to make a difference. Thanks that we are, our hearts are open and our ears are, hope, are open and that we've come together in a community to acknowledge and to give space to George Floyd, who I'm sure had no idea what message would be ultimately. We are grateful for him. We are grateful for Breonna Taylor, who was also killed recently in Ahmad Arbery, as well as Tony McDade was a trans man who was killed by police last week. We say their names because we don't want their names to be lost. We say their names because they are the ones who are giving us courage. We say their names because we want them to know that we are their transition and that their spirits will lost. And we thank you for this moment, a chance to, to listen, to be united, to learn, and to be curious. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. Really appreciate it. All right. So we are going to start our conversation with Malia Lazu. Malia, if you can unmute yourself. Um, and Renee, if you don't mind putting yourself back on mute. Um, we are going to turn it over to Malia and Malia is going to take us through some black history. And when Malia is done, um, then Debbie is going to take us through some white history. And then we're gonna have some conversation. So take it away, Malia. Thank you, Suzanne. And it's, it is so wonderful to be here with so many wonderful women. Um, you know, we all know these are hard times. Um, these aren't the first hard times. And so to get into space where you can feel supported, where you can feel seen, where you can feel loved um, is critical and probably the number one thing we should be doing um, right now. When I think about racism um, in, in America and structural racism, um, I think about the history of America because I can't talk about structural racism without saying, that it is a critical component of our success. Um, it is in our DNA. Um, and so why is that important? It's been important because George Floyd is an outcome of the American system working the way it's supposed to. And I think we often want to think about things in the past and then get shocked about um, current things. And the fact of the matter is, is that current things reflect our history. Um, the present is just decisions that we've made in our history. Um, and we have made these decisions to make Black Lives Matter less. And so I think it's important um, that we start with the history. Um, so structural racism in five minutes. Um, maybe the next time we'll do it, we'll do it with wine and we can do um, drunk, <laughs> drunk history, structural racism. Um, but I think we need to start with manifest destiny, right? I mean, manifest destiny, um, all of a sudden, God has ordained our capitalism, right? God has ordained our presence. God has ordained our colonialism. Um, and it's what allows us to kill Indians. Um, it's what allows us to enslave people. Um, and so you start seeing this definition of human and who, who is human. Um, really being um, identified as white, right? As the people who were ordained by God to bring religion, to bring capitalism um, to, to these worlds. Um, I'm originally from Hawaii uh, and growing up in Hawaii is an amazing place because you don't get American history until high school. Um, and you learn a lot about the Hawaiian history. And so I grew up learning about Manifest Destiny. Um, that was something we learned a lot about. And we learned that because of Manifest Destiny, um, we have very few Hawaiians left. Um, and that that thinking was able to colonize the Hawaiian people. Um, and so it starts there. It starts with indigenous genocide. Um, and indigenous genocide, one could say, is just a you know hop, skip, and a jump from chattel slavery, right? And we see chattel slavery, again, reinforcing who humans are 
and who humans aren't. Chattel slavery makes people, um, you know, makes Africans um, chattel. It makes them being able to be owned. We once again see the expansion of our love of private property, um, something that we also um, came up with when we were colonizing because of our ordained right. Um, and slavery, bam, now we're talking about race in America, right? Um, and so while we think about slavery as a long time ago, um, it's actually quite new um, to our country. Um, we probably had some form of slavery for as long as we haven't. Um, and if you add in Jim Crow and other things like that, um, what you'll see is that we have a long way to go before we even get close to being free, which makes people like George Floyd and the other names that Brene mentioned, not only tragic, um, but a tradition, an American tradition. Um, you know, so when I talk about chattel slavery and I talk about the definition of humanness, you also wanna remember that this is being tied to capitalism. Free labor is how we become an empire. Um, and so when we think about how do we undo this structural racism, what we're also saying is how do we undo how we make money as a country? How do we undo GDP? How do we undo our powerful us having things that, and now, you know, obviously if anyone has a cell phone, um, you are supporting some form of child work that you probably don't support. So it's not that, you know, it's not that you can avoid it, but it's worth holding. And, and, and it's worth recognizing that America's glory is built on free labor. Um, and that's why it's so exciting to see conversations like reparations um, and everyone on this call, please read the 1619 if you haven't, although you probably have because you're on this call. Um, and so chattel slavery leads us to civil war, um, you know, shout out to Harriet Tubman and the many slaves who actively fought for their freedom. Um, a quote that I know people say, oh, Harriet Tubman said, she didn't say, um, you know, but was that I could have free, I freed a thousand slaves and I could have freed a thousand more if they only knew they were slaves. Um, and I think that's also generational ownership of your body um, will, will make you scared of, of your freedom. And, and that's the, the outcomes for people of color um, of, of chattel slavery. We get into the civil war, yay, we win. Oh, you know, four score and seven years ago, our forefather. Um, but then we immediately fall into the lost cause. Um, you know, think of the Confederate um, statues being built, right? Think of the redefinition of the civil war. It became about states' rights. Um, it was not about slavery. Um, it became, um, what was that movie? Um, Gone with the Wind, Gone with the Wind. Um, and, and, you know, this, we began to retell our history to make it seem like, well, slavery was obviously wrong, but that's not what this was about. Um, the lost cause leads to the obvious acceptance of Jim Crow, right? You're, you're able to once again, lose our humanity that we were able to gain during reconstruction, during the civil war. Um, you know, Jim Crow um, leads us to Emmett Till, right? Um, Emmett Till is the first name that I'm naming, um, but please know the years we have just talked about, millions and tens of millions of African bodies and black bodies have been lost. Um, Emmett Till is killed his mother decides to have an open casket. And his mother decides to make sure her boy and his death is a catalyst for this country. That that little beautiful boy who was just at a store to get something to eat or drink or whatever he was doing at the store, that his life was actually going to be worth something. And so we have Emmett Till, and so we have George Floyd. How we get from Emmett Till to George Floyd, we know. But we got there because of who this country was, is, and needs to be in order to continue to be a global power. We've guaranteed, we, we've tied ourselves to it. So what do we do? Um, 
we undo the story of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We undo that story. We understand that if you are privileged, I am asking you to take a step down because equality is a step down from privilege. And I ask you to think, what stories are you believing? What stories are you telling that make Emmett Till and George Floyd so similar? What are we actually telling ourselves that are making black bodies not be human bodies. And it starts with this country's tie and our belief that whiteness is ordained by God. So that's my little structural racism history, Suzanne. Malia, I don't know how anybody can do it in six minutes, but you did. It was absolutely incredible and astounding. I hope all of our listeners have learned something. There may have been some words in there that you did not or were not familiar with. If you don't know um, about chattel slavery, if you don't know who Emmett Till was, it is not too late to learn. Um, these are things that you can look up in the history book. At one point in time, I had to look them up. Okay, so we are all in this together. It is not about who knows what when. It's that you are curious to learn. Um, I also wanna say that I'm gonna have to get up in a second and close my window because there's obviously some big protest going on here in Boston because there are helicopters circling. And so I'm gonna get up and close my window in just a second. But before I do, I want to introduce the extraordinary Debbie Irving. So Malia, thank you. Put yourself on mute. Debbie, you can unmute yourself. Debbie is going to give us the equivalent version of white history. All right, Debbie, take it away. Thank you, and thank you, Malia. Of course, our, it's, you're gonna hear some of the same language because it's gonna be a little bit like this. Um, and for people listening, you know, 12 years ago, I would have been in your shoes saying, well, tell me what to do. Uh, it was only 12 years ago that I started what I call waking up. So here I go with what I would call white history. For me, it begins with the quote unquote discovering of America. Uh, which was a myth I bought into deeply. I have some Mayflower roots. In the idea that, our, that Europeans are discovering a new continent. They were very sophisticated uh, people living here. We call them, called them Indians and the Native Americans, indigenous people who had very sophisticated forms of agriculture and government um, and were doing quite well. So we really didn't discover anything. And when I think about that, that the very first time we step into is us collective white people, we bring with us a sense of entitlement. Um, of superiority and arrogance. And we're calling these people who are unfamiliar to us savages and, and heathens. So that's in our roots. If we flip forward to, jump forward to 1681, that is the first time any group of human beings in the history of humanity are called white. It is the invention of whiteness. It happens in 1681. Um, the plantations in Maryland and Virginia are thriving and um, the people who are working for them are Portuguese and free blacks and uh, indentured white people. It's a huge hodgepodge and they become the masses and they start uprising as, these, as the plantation class is building wealth. They want more protection. They want access to land uh, and they're not getting it. And so they start rebelling. And the most famous of these rebellions is Bacon's Rebellion. Uh, the white plantation that's redundant, the plantation owning class, white elite male, uh, needs to somehow come up with a divide and conquer strategy. Naming a group of those people white is the way they do it. And so those who can be classified as white uh, move up a notch and suddenly there's an underclass of everybody who cannot be considered white. We can now trace that history to the idea of assimilation. If you're in this country, it is not a multicultural pluralistic democracy. You are expected to look and act as white as possible. Um, and it leads to legal cases throughout the years and who can and cannot be considered white. Jump forward to 1787, the formation of the US Constitution. 
Constitution, James Madison, is on record as saying that the, that the design of this country is going to be to protect the minority of the opulent from the majority. So when people say that the system is broken, I say, no, it's not. It is working absolutely the way it was designed. At the same time, the Constitution is trying to create a system that protects the minority of the opulent. There's the generation of the myth of meritocracy, that there is this beautiful country where all you have to do is work hard. It is the land of the free. So we have two very, very conflicting um, ideologies that are baked in which I think is the essence of why our foundation is so broken. Broken. We um, leap forward to 1790, the Naturalization Act, which determines for 150 plus years, Renee, you probably know the answer to that. Um, the Naturalization Act determines who can become a naturalized citizen. Citizenship is huge. It determines who, if you can own property, if you can have vote, if you are uh, have the right to being protected under the Constitution. The Naturalization Act requires that you are a free white of good character. Well, white is subjective, and good character, I'd say, is subjective. And so it gets uh, gives a lot of power to those in power to determine how they're going to control those levers, that divide and conquer levers, who's going to get to be white and who not puts a lot of pressure on white ethnics, Jews, Italians, Irish, Polish, to assimilate quickly into whiteness, to get all the benefits that come with it. In 30, that's where we have the Indian Removal Act tied to Manifest Destiny, uh, which is that white European descended people here um, are uh, God's chosen people. And it is their Christian duty to spread their goodness westward to the Pacific Ocean and eventually around the world. It's a justification for a nation building wealth building project, which is based on a full on genocide, a campaign of terror on indigenous people. It includes the creation of Indian boarding schools in which children 10 and under are rounded up and are brought to these schools where they are, I would say, tortured to become more white. The last one was closed in the 1970s. The indigenous history includes Bokan treaties, that is a chain that's been uninterrupted. We have a, an agreement that's just been broken here in Massachusetts with the Mashpee people. Uh, come forward to 1862, trans, trans uh, continental railway system. Suddenly there's all this labor needed. Slavery is about to end. Chinese people are used and abused. They are literally dropped in holes um, with bombs to bomb. Uh, mountainsides for the Canadian Railway. As soon as it's done, we have the Chinese Exclusion Act. This is the history of white people turning on and off the faucet of people coming in and out of the country as it suits the minority of the opulent. 1863, we have emancipation. There are no real, rep no real reparations. Um, there is no change in the narrative. There's no, wow, we're sorry, we thought you were subhuman. Nope. There's just this, no, now you're no longer a slave. So that creates the perfect conditions for, uh, uh, which then goes on to Jim Crow, which in, and now into mass incarceration. It is an unbroken chain. Each one of these pieces of history, an unbroken chain of profiting the minority of the opulent from free labor. Um, 1933, we have the New Deal, which comes along, sounds I was a history major and nothing I'm telling you did I learn at my high class fancy pants history major school. Um, the New Deal was a raw deal for a lot of people. Um, Social Security initially was really to benefit white people. It very intentionally excluded um, agricultural and domestic workers who were disproportionately black and brown. It also created the system of redlining in which uh, racial segregation was done. Mortgages were built uh, by and for white people. Uh, the GI Bill comes along in the 1940s and allows people to access that more G, white GIs to access that mortgage, while the 1.2 million black GIs can barely access it, like 4% of them do. Um, we had indigenous GIs, Asian GIs, and Latinx GIs, all of whom could barely access that. When you look at the wealth gap today, that was a major um, contribution to it there. Jump, oh, and now we look at COVID. And, and you know, once upon a time, I would have said, well, that's proof positive that white people have superior bodies. That's why we're not getting so sick. No, look at redlining. Look at the way our housing footprint is. We've got black and brown people living in cramped and crowded housing by force, not by choice. 
and uh, we've got black and brown people by social role and, and frontline jobs, not by choice, because that's all that's sort of the glass ceilings that's been placed on black and brown people. Um, okay, back to 1964, and this is my last piece, the Civil Rights Act. It's supposed to be the, oh, we're done now. There were no reparations. There was no real narrative change. And guess what? All the stuff that got put forward in the Civil Rights Act, uh, in the Civil Rights Act has been dialed back and back and back and back. So what we are left with is an unbroken chain of racist capitalism um, that rests on the Enlightenment period, which we can talk about when we talk about white supremacy, meaning that there, um, the minority of the opulent has always not only had greater access to rights, resources, uh, representation, and respect, they've been able to control the levers of who does and does not uh, get uh, various degrees of access to rights, representation, resources, and respect. Ooh. Wow. All right. So I'm curious for the people who are watching, and there are now 281 of you here online with us um, who are watching this conversation. Um, how do you feel? How does it feel when we say, the history from black person's point of view, black people's point of view versus the history from a white point of view. Um, Denise says, I think I now understand what we white people state black lives matter. It must come from a daily practice, a daily integration. Yes, thank you for saying that. All right, so we got a little bit edumacated just now. And now what I would like to do is uh, tell you a little bit about my waking up story. Because a lot of you are probably like me. I was not very awake. Um, just like Debbie said, hers started 12 years ago. I, I have to say mine started a long time ago, but I wasn't really awake until some events that happened. And I wanna take you through them so that you can start to figure out your own story. It's not about how it happened for me or how it happened for Debbie. It's how it can happen for each of us individually based on our circumstances. So, you know, I grew up in a pretty Tony town outside of the city of Boston. And um, I didn't know I was different from anybody else. I played with kids and we all seemed the same when I was in nursery school. Um, but then uh, one day when I was five years old, there was a girl who lived across the street and um, her name was Kathy and every single day after nap, we would, I would run across the street to her house and I would knock on her door and she would fly the door open and we'd go running out into the woods and we'd play. And then one day when I was five years old, I walked across the street and I knocked on the door and she opened the big thick wood door, but she left the screen door closed. And she said, I'm not allowed to play with you anymore. I was like, I'm sorry, what? I'm five. Why can't you play with me? She said, because you're a Christ killer. I was like, why can't you play with me? She said, you're, you're a Christ killer. I didn't know what a Christ killer was. She slams the door on me. And I go running across the street to my mom. And I'm like, mama, Gaddy won't play with me. And she's like, why, what happened? And I, I don't know what's a Christ killer. Now, this is pre-Vatican II when it was, decided publicly that Jews didn't kill Jesus. But this is what this family across the street had learned about Jews. And I was one of a few Jewish families in my hometown. So at the tender age of five, I was stamped with being different. Now, no one outside of me knew that um, because I looked like this and I fit in visually um, I didn't look like a black kid or a brown kid, but I no longer was right on the inside. That one little piece of time completely changed who I was and, and how I saw myself in the world. So the next year I went to first grade in my public school system and it was just after Boston had started busing kids out to the suburbs to get a better education. And I saw these kids come off a bus, about 25 of them come off the bus together. And I was like, wow, they look like a group of people who belong together. Maybe if I become friends with them, 
I'll have a group of friends. And then I won't feel like I don't have friends. Because now I was concerned that as a, now I found out it was a Jew, I didn't know that before then, that I didn't know if I'd ever be able to have friends again. So this became my group of friends. And honestly, throughout my years of school and into high school, I was one of the only white kids who ever had after school play dates in, down, in the downtown Boston areas of Dorchester and Roxbury. It was, um, thank God my parents were pretty cool about it. And um, I had a lot of friends that were in my class that were black. And it has been part of my life forever that I have black friends. I would say of my close set of girlfriends, the majority of them are black. I'm just lucky that way. I feel like it's a great gift because it gives me a perspective on life I didn't know. But even with this much history of black people in my life and friends, it wasn't until two decades ago that I had my waking up to the next level of what it meant to wake up. Because I had friends that I noticed had to be treated differently or I'd have friends who would come visit me in Boston, they'd be black and they'd say, it was great visiting you, but I never wanna come back here again because this is the most racist city I've ever been in in my life, which I didn't see because I didn't see. And I remember about 20 years ago, there was a friend of mine and we were having a conversation about race because honestly, if you're a white person and you have friends who are black and you've never talked about race with your black friends, they're not really your friends, they're acquaintances. Once you have the conversations with them about what it's really like to be black, what it's like for them and how you can relate to them differently, then you know that you have a friend who's black. And so I was talking with one of my black friends. She couldn't join us tonight for this call, but she woke me up in such a way that was so uncomfortable. I found myself screaming during our conversation. And I will tell you that one of the reasons I teach emotional intelligence now, one of the reasons I teach people about self-awareness and consciousness and why I started Dear Human is because you need to understand yourself in order to understand other kinds of people. And so this dear friend of mine very patiently took me through the following story. I said to her, well, look, I'm Jewish. Jews have been persecuted for 5,000 years and black people have only been persecuted for like, I don't know, 400 years. How come the Jews seem to have figured it out and the black people didn't? I, I don't understand. Can you please help me understand this? And we were mad. I gotta tell you, I don't scream a lot, but we were mad at each other. We were sitting in my kitchen and we were mad. And thank God for her patience. And thank God my thick skull started to crack open because she said the following to me and it, it changed my way of seeing the world. She, I might cry when I say this. She, she said, look, Suzanne, here's how it worked on the West Coast of Africa when, when African people were gathered up from their tribes in inland Africa and brought to the Western shore to be shipped off in slave ships to the rest of the world in the West. She said, if you spoke a language from the tribe that you came from, they made sure that in the holding cells and then in the ships you got on, you were put with people who didn't speak your language so that every single person was a man or woman for themselves. What I knew is that when Jews were persecuted over the millennia, that Jews were ghettoized together. That we were put in a group and we built networks that no matter where you meet a Jew today, if you say you need something, they will say, oh, I have a friend who has a daughter and that daughter's husband has a brother who can get that for you. And part of that networking is built into who we are as Jews. And it wasn't allowed to be built into what happened to black people when they were brought across on slave ships and they were separated from those they loved. And even when they were on the plantations, when they managed to find someone and fall in love and they jumped over the broom to have a marriage ceremony because God forbid the plantation master would see them get married, if they found out they were separated, one was sold off. People could not develop deep networks for years, for decades, for hundreds of years. 
And it was this moment in time that woke me up to not only a privilege that I didn't know I had, but to a story that I had been holding on to for so long about my people. Because this is what I learned, is that just because I have privilege doesn't mean I didn't work hard for what I got. But it also means that there are other people who did not start off as well as I did. It doesn't matter that I was a Jew and it doesn't matter that I'm a woman. The fact that I'm white gives me a head start. It gives me a tailwind behind my back. So I'm sharing that story with you, hopefully to get some opening for you of the kind of deep work and thinking that we need to go through to start asking ourselves the questions of how can I relate to other people where they are with who they are and why this is such an important conversation for us to be having today because all of you have indicated to me by coming here today that you are interested in, in knowing what to do, how to show up, how you can engage, how can you be part of the solution right now? How can you use the, your privilege for good? And in order to do that, you need to understand where it comes from, where your privilege starts and where it stops. So I'm gonna end my portion of this, but I wanna now hand it over to Brene. I'm gonna look through the comments and see if there's anything going on in the comments that I can pull from. But Brene, I would love for you to do what you do best, which is bridge us and take it forward. Thank you. I mean, Suzanne, thank you for sharing your story. And Malia and Deborah, thank you so much for, for what you shared. You know, what's really interesting is, I don't know if this is true for you, Malia, but the history was not taught to us either. Uh, we had to learn a lot. And you don't, I, I remember being in my college, you know, also a very, also a very, very special unique college, um, and going to my history class. And Black people kind of showed up in history in the United States, it was US history, like slavery, and then again in the 60s, and they were like rioting, right? So, I remember at one point I said to my professor, so like what were the black people doing in the country through this entire time? And he was just puzzled by the question. I ended up dropping that class because I could not, I couldn't tolerate not being seen. You know, and it's sort of like these four R's that Deborah said, and I want to just repeat them. We are talking about the differential that pe Black people experience in this country and quite frankly throughout the world has a lot to do with rights, resources, representation, and respect. Did I get those right, Deb? You're frozen, but I'm going to believe I did. <laughs> come back, come back. Yeah, and, and I didn't hear you. Here, here's what I bet you said, rights, resources, rep representation, which is what you did not get in that history class. And I would say that's for tied to respect. Yes. And so when, when we talk about white privilege, what we're really saying is, in what ways are you aware? And are, what ways are you aware of how the system, without you asking, without you even earning, is showing you that you are respected? <laughs> what about the representation? Where are you seeing yourself? Are you ever not seeing yourself in TV, in history, in movies, in you name it? And what are your resources? And what is your access to resources, right? And also this whole idea of rights. Because I think what Mal Malia said is like, oh yeah, you got some rights, but, and also Deborah said, you got rights, but you're, oh, sorry, your group is not included in this group, right? Like I always say like for women, for example, you know, I don't care how brilliant you were as a woman. Before 1920, as a white woman, I don't care how str politically strategic you were, you were not going to run for an office because you could not vote because women, white women, oh, we're not even talking about 
black folks, we're talking about white women were cut off from those rights, right? So a lot of the mythology we have about meritocracy is mythology because it's missing sort of who's been given access, how people have been positioned, how well they're respected. And that these are all linked. For me, the hardest work is for us to connect the dots because you see the invisibility of privilege is so well, <laughs> so create well created that it's almost invisible. It's like me as a straight person. Like I don't always notice the way the world is working for me. The way people are like happy to hear about my boyfriend and happy to hear about the child I had with a man, you know, but, but and I, I don't know how easy it is for me to talk about it and to, and, and to actually get access to things with people out asking me like, well, are you certain or are you really moral or like all of the ways that any of us have a position in our society where we are preferred because that's really the idea of privilege is that you're preferred and as a result of being in the group that has been preferred for a period of time, you get access to opportunity. That opportunity allows you to show your best. Your best actually turns out to be dominance, right? So if you give a group a lot of resources and rights over a period of time, unless they are really not with it, they are going to figure out how to use that to benefit themselves and those they love and respect. So you start to get a over-representation of people in certain areas education, medicine, uh, banking, you name it, you get this overrepresentation at the exact same time you have laws that are pushing down anybody who's trying to move up. So you get to maintain that power. And so when we're talking about privilege, we're also talking about power, power to continue to maintain that status quo. And when we look at our criminal justice system, and Deborah, you didn't even go into this, but I would love for you to make that connection because when we talk about this idea of, uh, you know, oppression and slavery, and then ultimately getting to Jim Crow, where Jim Crow is like only certain people can do certain things in certain places. And then you start to see people trying to survive because people need to try to survive. And then there are also like places where you can work and places where you cannot. All of that actually positions people poorly in society and it has impact in so many ways. And then we start to go to mass incarceration where we figure out, like, I don't know, everybody knows this now, but with this opiate crisis, we've got people who, and, and you know, don't get me wrong, I am grateful that we see it as a health problem. It's just painful that it took us white people being, um, you know, communities being devastated by this to say, hey, wait, maybe we should help. Maybe we should give them resources where we have people in jail right now, right now who are black and brown and they had heroin. It's the same thing. Or they were selling small amounts of weed, which has impacted not just the individual, but their community, their family and their ability to move ahead. So there are so many connections that are kind of destabilizing once you start putting the whole thing together. And what I want people to recognize is as you're learning this, you have to be kind to yourself. Like there is a whole thing you can do with the guilt and shame. You can go right after it. You can just be at it all the time. But on some level, that's you refusing to figure out <laughs> what you're gonna do about what you've learned, right? So all of us, we, the shame is real. You just can't let the shame prevent you from actually evolving into someone who can help 
this present situation. So that is actually is what I want to say because as I have learned these things, um, I, I I can I can feel overwhelmed, and I would expect you know around my privilege, around um, not having a disability, around having been uh, educated in elite. Um, institutions. I live in Los Angeles. I watch people trying to eke out an existence on the pavement. I also have shame. And I am also positioned in the society in a particular way, and I can see the inequity. But I try not to go down that path of like, this is so bad and I'm so bad and I'm part of the problem, blah, blah, blah. Instead, I try to move forward. And I think that's, Suzanne, when I think about the white people that I know who are waking up to criminal, the injustice, the, to police brutality, which is something that I have seen and lived through for so long, I know there, it's destabilizing. I know it's upsetting. I know that it's rageful. You know, James Baldwin said, you know, to be a black person in America is to be in a constant state of rage, right? So black people have been managing their rage for a very long time. And so I wanna really encourage my white brothers and sisters uh, or however you identify, that's a whole nother area, right? Uh, all of my folks I, who are white, I'd like to encourage you to learn to hold this. And it's not every day and not every hour, but I really wondered also, Debbie, as you were waking up, how did you manage that whole like instability that comes along with realizing, oh, this isn't exactly what I thought it was. I'm not exactly who I thought I was. Take your mute off because we want to hear yes. what you're saying. What I'd love to do, Renee, that was so beautiful. I'm going to open it up for all of us to have a conversation. And um, you guys go for it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dive into the comments. There's been a bunch of really great things going by. I want to try to capture them. So uh, if you guys can talk amongst yourselves in coffee talk language, uh, I will see if I can find us some good comments. I'm going to make us into a four screen. All right. Go ahead, Deb. Okay. So, you know, it. I, I really felt it in my body. And this is very embodied work. And so I remember feeling nauseated and dizzy and I, and I had a ginger ale with me for about two or three months because that's how nauseated I was as I started unraveling really um, a whole old belief system and figuring out how to take in this new information. Um, and that's the thing, it's not linear learning. Like in math, you learn addition and subtraction and multiplication and division so that you can go on and learn use those tools moving forward. This is unraveling a whole belief system and starting to reconstruct a new one. And it is hard. And these ideas attached to feelings in our bodies. Uh, I got some great advice at one point. I was having a full-blown panic attack about something um, unrelated to racism. This is before I started waking up. And I've used this trick a lot. And that is that uh, when I started to feel really uh, anxious, you know, we when we get really full of feeling, we can discharge it on someone, we can turn it on ourselves, which creates guilt and shame, depression and anxiety, or we can just feel it. And so I had to do a lot to learn to just feel. And I, got, I was given this image. Imagine um, that the amount I was able to feel once upon a time was like a little tiny sipping straw, you know, like you get in a cocktail glass. That's how much capacity I had to feel. But every time I just sat and let myself feel, it got a little bit bigger. I feel like I've got a gargantuan PVC pipe now running up and down me. I could give it to me. Like I can hold so much discomfort now. It's not that it's not uncomfortable. It's that I know how to sit with it. So I don't need to discharge it and I don't need to turn it on myself. So um, a lot of times people of color will say to white people, um, just sit with it, just sit in your feelings. And for me, uh, what that really means is sitting and uh, letting myself grow my capacity. You know, Debbie, can I um, jump in there? Because I think whenever we have 
these flashpoints. You know, I always say like, it's good to think, what can you, what are you doing every day? Before George Floyd was killed, what were you doing? And then when the flashpoint happens, what do you do during the flashpoint? Yeah. And then once the flashpoint happens, what do you do after the flashpoint? Mm. We don't have any more George Floyds. And, you know, one of the first things that happens is that you do get a lot of white guilt, right? And shame. Oh my God, I feel so bad. What can I do? And there's two things that I want folks to be aware of, of how sometimes that can feel. Um, the first is that it puts the onus on the per person of color to help you figure out what you should do to stop us from being killed. Um, and there's already a lot going on in our head. Um, so to ask us what to do, we may not actually know. Um, and, and I think that that's very, very important. And the second thing is white people will want to do, they'll want to do. And I think that also reinforces the privilege um, in this sense mm -hmm. and help you. If, if you just give me the right answer, I'm going to make your, you know, I, I'm going to be able to fix it. And based on, you know, the history that we went through, um, based on the DNA of this country, which is brutal capitalism, um, you know, there isn't anything you can do. And so when we, you know, when we say sit here with us, um, you know, there's something in the shared helplessness that may make us come up with other answers. Um, you know, so I think this mm -hmm. idea of action and fix it, and I'm so happy you brought that up, Debbie, because I, I think it also reinforces this idea that you can do something about it as an individual white person. Um, and yes, mm -hmm. there's things you can do, um, but really it's, um, it's baked into our DNA. It's who we are. I mean, you know, it, it goes from Indian savages to three-fifths of a person, right? Um, I, you know, all, all of the things that you said, um, Debbie, around, you know, the different laws that um, solidified whiteness. Um, and so I, you know, sitting with it, I think is very important because it also helps sort of undo that feeling of whites being able to save blacks versus us coming together to live a human to, to live as humans. Yeah, um, Malia, thank you for that. And, and Debbie and Verne, um, there's a comment from Jess Rothwell that I think is um, great here. Um, I had posted a, a live yesterday, uh, if anybody wants to watch it in preparation for this. And, and part of what she says is love the language that uh, Suzanne used about it's a white people problem to figure out how to solve things because it reminds me of how we talk in the women's equality scene I've worked with solving violence against women is partially or largely a men's issue. So um, I think that this is such an important thing that uh, is, bears, bears repeating here, which is that in order to make a difference in a system that was created by white people, white people have to break it down. It is not up to black people to have to reinvent a system created by others. Uh, Einstein famously once said, uh, you can't solve a problem with the mind who, that created it. And this is exactly true here. And it, I'm so grateful that so many of you are sticking with us in this conversation because- And Frederick Douglass said, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Now I, that- I agree, Lord. Uh, yeah, I don't want to, I, 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 one of the things that I thought was really interesting is what Malia, what you said about trying to solve this together. So that, would be a new tool, right? Um, that, you know, D w, you've done a lot of sort of thinking about what is whiteness mm -hmm. and what is, and I would even say, what is Western whiteness kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it is mastery, um, taking control, um, individualism and so forth. We're talking about collectivism. Like the only way this is going to get solved I hear, I do believe that people sometimes think that the problem with black people is that black people are a problem. And that is what we are saying, absolutely not. It is not that black people are a problem and that's why they have problems, right? It is that we are acknowledging where the real problem stems from, which is a structure and a system that was purposefully engineered to keep people in their place, right? And you know, it, it's and the capitalism helps. Like if you were a person who grew up without a lot of means, but you're white, 
there is a very close analogy here to the ways in which people who don't have a lot are kept in that position, right? So it's not only, we can see oppression around lots of different groups and there's a lot of intersection, but what I hear Malia saying is that if we can acknowledge, learn, see, talk, then we're much better and a much better place to think about how we build a new thing. When I'm looking at who's protesting on that street, there is, a, there is sadness in me about what is happening, but there is also like this little piece of hope that the coalition is building, that people are waking up, that they're seeing that they're interconnected, that their interest is, is connected to this person's interest, that there cannot be justice unless for anyone, unless there's justice, justice for everyone. Individualism is a tool to prevent you from understanding that we breathe the same air. If COVID didn't tell us that, I don't know what we're going to do, right? Yeah, thank you for that, Brene. I think that's great clarification. And, um, and I think the, the point was that I, for me, um, white people have to be part of the equation and have to get out of their own comfort and their beautiful, quiet, peaceful homes and do something. And that's what tonight's about. Yeah, Deb. Yeah, so I wanna go back to Malia's quote about um, the master's tools. Well, you can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. And so I think it's important for white people to be able to understand what white culture, whiteness is, because we aren't bad when we embody and then act out whiteness we create harm. So in the example that Malia was giving about, you know, sometimes we just, we don't want to have the answers for you and just sit with us in this kind of collective helplessness. And maybe from there, something can spring. Um, you know, what's, I think that there's something egocentric actually when white people want to figure out how to fix. And I'll speak from my own perspective. I want to fix this problem because I don't wanna feel the pain of this problem. This is too awkward for me. I can't handle it. So let's fix it and make it go away. So it's really crucial, I think, for white people to get really introspective and curious about our own, what is whiteness? What is white culture? How am I um, just um, bound to time and, I need, and, and productivity and efficiency? Um, and so we start to make sure that we're not showing up with the norms of whiteness in this coalition building, but that we're understanding that the collective trumps the individual. You can't separate individuals from collectivism. That there are all kinds of ways to relate to time. Sometimes if you're having an amazing conversation, who gives a shit about the agenda? Going with what, sorry, uh, that's a white privilege to swear, by the way. Um, you know, if you're having a great, a great conversation or you're, you're getting deep into solving a problem, let the agenda go. Um, I heard an incredible, I wish I could quote her name right now, a professor from Keene State who said, I'd rather be in time than on time. So there is a lot to learn um, about whiteness so that we white people, all of us, we've all been swimming in this water, can divest ourselves from those norms, which actually undermined our best, our best intentions all the time. Those are the master's yes. tools for me. So I have a, another question from Sam Spear. Um, how can I, as a privileged white man, use my station to move the needle to improve the narrative? I constantly wrestle if it's enough to just listen and empathize. Who wants to take that one? Um, I the first want to take a, a crack at it. Um, you know, and again, I think it gets back to some of what we were just saying of what, you know, what is what is leveraging the privilege, right? What what is the doing? Um, and you know, Verne said something really, really important, which is that we have to love ourselves through this. Like this is filled with hate that, you know, everything that you just heard, all of us talking about all that history that starts with being able to hate. And when I was doing nonviolent work um, with Harry Belafonte and with, um, you know, some civil rights leaders, one of the things that I learned is that before they would go to protest, they would have a day of prayer and fast. 
and they mm-hmm. were fasting and they were mm. careful and they would get aligned with their God, you know, not pushing anyone's God, but with their God um, in order to make a change. And there's something with fasting with people, right? There's something with doing ritual with people um, that also takes you to other places. Um, and so, yes, you know, sign a petition, show up to a march, support a policy, but also, um, you know, invite your friends to do something that may help you guys come up with different things to do, right? Um, you know, go to, uh, you know, here we have some amazing, um, you know, indigenous First Nation brothers and sisters. They do powwows, um, you know, go to the Caribbean festival. Once you start modeling behavior, um, I think that can actually be way more helpful than people think, um, you know? And again, I know we all wanna think that it's a policy. Deb brought out a bunch of policies. <laughs> that became law. It's not that. It's how we see our humanity. It, it's, the, it's the space. It's how we define the space between us um, that is so critical. And as a white male, you can be a really powerful translator to other white males. So when you hear someone say, oh yeah, well, did you hear about that riot and there was vandalism? You can say, no, but I did hear about people responding to the police lynchings that are happening. And you know, you can say that anywhere in your office, at a restaurant, in you know, at a bar with your friends, have those uncomfortable conversations um, and and let people know um, how you feel as a white male with privilege. Um, I think we also a lot of times assume that um, the middle class whiteness is assumed to be the norm. Um, and so challenge that, <laughs> right? Ch- challenge that um, the, the ways you can. Um, and th- I mean, again, there's always steps, but I think right now it's it's this conversation um, and and how we're choosing to live differently. Um, everyone should go see "I Am Not Your Negro" by James Baldwin. I think you can get it on Netflix, right, Brene? I don't know. I think, <laughs> I think but he asked the question: Why did America need a Negro in the first place? So and, I, I would. Yeah, sorry, I'll babble. Yeah, thank you. I would. I would add to that, um, look at your sphere of influence, whatever it might be. It could be that you're the person in your family that people listen to and trust. There's an area where you can start to talk and translate and share information. Is it that you're the head of a particular team or department or division? Because another word that we said we were gonna talk about, you might start to see some bias, not bias of people who are specifically attempting to keep people, just people who like their own selves, you know, hiring themselves, promoting themselves, giving themselves more compensation than everyone else. It's like starting to recognize, is there a bias going on here? And sometimes it's not bias against, it really is the most subtle uh, type of bias is the bias for, the, the benefit of the doubt we give people when they make mistakes, but other people make the same mistakes. And it's just like, oh, I knew that this was going to be a problem because you have, you are selective about the information you're using to confirm your own uh, bias uh, about who's good and who's not. So that's another way. Um, what what Malia also said is, um, I always say, go somewhere where you're the minority. Like, just make yourself good and uncomfortable. Um, don't know the code, don't know the right dress. I had a bunch of friends one time who went to a black church and they had, they were very casually dressed and they arrived at church and everybody was dressed to the nines and had hats and everything. And they were like, oh my hey. gosh, we did a terrible thing. We wore jeans to church. We, were, we didn't want people to feel like we didn't respect their, I was like, it's fine. You were white, we knew it was gonna be a <laughs> We're used to seeing white people in jeans at church. So um, <laughs> may we all be that free. But um, but it's one of those things where you want to know what it might feel like mm-hmm. to be in the other group. It's hard to like make that happen in America because you've got to find like a place where you're not only disliked, but you're thought of less than as a human. So it's kind of hard to find that space, but you can try to put yourself in different places. You can expand your relationships. Now, I'm not saying go out to any old black person and be like, can we be friends? That's not what I'm saying. There are probably people right now in your life somewhere 
who you've ignored or you haven't actually interacted with um, as an equal, as a peer. Um, and there may be an area also for you to start having an influence. That was brilliant, both of you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and it's a doozy, um, and it's kind of a culmination of a bunch of questions I'm seeing, and then we're going to do kind of our lightning round, things you can do starting today, and then our hope is that we're going to come back together and do another round of this, because there's so many questions going by that I can't even begin to capture them all, um, so that's amazing. I love that there's still 300 people on with us. Um, participating in this conversation. There have been hundreds and hundreds of comments that have been made. So uh, thank you, all of you. Um, so the question that I'm seeing a lot of is um, twofold. Uh, what is it going to take to dismantle the system? And do we need to get rid of capitalism to do it? The big one. So what I'd love to do is get your brief thoughts on it, um, knowing that this could be an entire hour and a half conversation. And then uh, I'll, I'll cut us off in a few minutes. We'll talk about this for about five, 10 minutes. And then we'll close up with our recommendations for things people can do starting tomorrow. So who wants to go first? <laughs> Don't all shout at once. <laughs> I went first last time. So I'm, I stepped up, now I'm stepping back. Come on, ladies, one of y'all got to step up. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. Okay, so there's capitalism. And now I'm so um, rattled by the capitalism part of the question. What was the other part? So it's a two part question, like what is it going to take to dismantle the system and is it a requirement that dis that capitalism go away in order to dismantle the system. I think um, we have to convince in order to dismantle the system, we have to convince a critical mass that the system works for no one. Even I am one of the most privileged people other than gender i'm at the top of the heap and um, this system dumbed me down as a human being because in order for me to be able to see other people and treat other people um, as other humans and to be able to sleep at night knowing that people are, are living on the pavement, for instance, um, I had to dehumanize a little part of myself. I had to feel a little bit less. And so, and everybody knows the feeling of having to conform you know, I have to make myself just right to fit into this space, even people in the most privileged, you know, I haven't met a white man yet that when I say, tell me about the moment you were taught not to cry. And it's a really painful story. It's as impressionable as you being told you were a Jew. And so, um, you know, all of our humanity is restrained, our human potential is, is squashed by the system. And so I think, really helping people understand that it's a dehumanizing system where really nobody wins. And it's certainly, I don't think, sustainable. Capitalism, mm, um, the thing about capitalism, you know, we are all capable of greed. We are all capable of generosity. We are capable of compassion and cruelty. Like the whole range, every human comes into the world with all these capacities. What bothers me about free reign capitalism is that it taps into um, the selfish, most egotistic sides of us. It, it encourages and rewards greed. It encourages and rewards stepping on other people. Um, it encourages and rewards lying and denying. And so I do have a big problem with capitalism. Um, I've been really impressed. All the solutions I've seen, by the way, are coming out of black and brown communities. I feel like if, uh, if the entire country of white people took a gargantuan step back and let black and brown people take the center, wow, we could have a beautiful country and it wouldn't be about hating white people or reversing the hierarchy. It's about a much more circular collective beloved community structure. Um, there's a lot going on that I've seen around wealth system that's collective wealth um, in communities where communities pool their wealth and they make collective decisions about what's good for their community. So I'm starting to see models other than capitalism work small scale. Um, they're really exciting. They're a great place for white people to donate money. And um, yeah, I guess that that's what I would say. One of my favorite quotes is by Adrian Marie Brown a black woman who is an amazing thinker and she uh, is uh, a science fiction uh, enthusiast and writer, Octavia Butler was one of her mentors. And she says, you know, when it comes to social justice, um, we're actually engaging in science fiction because we are creating a world that does not yet exist. Mm. So 
I don't have the answers to those questions, but I just gave some thoughts. Thank you. Anybody else want to add to that question or answer you know, to that question? Yeah, what I would add is, because um, Debbie, I think you brought you brought up the, the tension so much about the capitalist system that is about individualism, that is about competition, that is built on someone being lesser than. And what, I mean, could there be a different type of capitalism? I don't know, maybe, but it certainly has not helped to create equality, but it's supposed to. And people say it's the best system we have for distributing, you know, resources. And you're like, who are you talking to? The best system for whom? Because you're like, until I can see that enjoyed by the majority of people, which it is not, I don't see how you are saying that. And what I'm really, what I really want to say is that when people really understand what it's going to take, they back out mm -hmm. because I know we have some good people. We got good people on the phone. I got good people I work with. We got good people in the world, good people out here marching, but are we prepared to do what we have to do? And then Lalia said that like, if we're going for equality that, and you have a bunch of stuff, you're going to probably have to redistribute that. Right? It's like someone said to me, well, you know, with all these taxes and blah, 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 you can't do this, you can't do that. And I was like, I would give up stuff so folks don't need to sleep on the street. Like, I don't need what I have. I could have a smaller thing if I could make it true that other people could live in dignity. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, how much is dignity worth to you? That you, like, what do you want to give up? And like, you know, folks, Suzanne, we talk about this, like people in the industry, we start trying to make space for women and different people of color, you know, to be in front of the camera, and behind the camera. But then some people who are in charge are like, they gave it to that woman or they gave it to, and like, and they don't, because they don't have a systems analysis. They don't understand that they have to be in a group that has been favored for so long. And now there's trying to be some equality and they have to figure out how to be okay with the fact that they're not just gonna instantly be the preferred one. And I think that's how we dismantle it. We have to ask ourselves some really hard questions. Amen. 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 Um, I think I would just add to that, do we need to dismantle or do we just build again? Um, and you know, I think so often, you know, King had that quote, um, what is it, we're, we're integrating, I feel we're, I'm integrating my people into a burning house. And then because he's, King and he's, you know, damn near Buddha Jesus, like he said, so we must become firemen, right? Um, and he lost his life. Like, is, is that, is that, are those the choices? And are those the choices we want to make? You know, I don't want to over romanticize martyrdom. Um, you know, I've worked with civil rights leaders who have lost husbands and wives and sons and daughters, and, and you don't feel that honor. I mean, you feel that honor, but you would rather have your dad, right? Um, I know that, that folks would rather, rather have their parents. And so what does that mean to choose? You know, and I think when I think about dismantling a system, I'm like, wait, we got to clean up what the white people did and then build something new for them. Like, it just sounds even more tiring. You know, um, and so it's such an appropriate question. Um, and, you know, but I wonder wh how, where is the energy best spent? And is it spent in de dismantling or is it spent in rebuilding? And I think the examples, you know, that Debbie talked about, about, you know, the collectivism that we're seeing, the co-op movements. I mean, New York City, the Bronx is having a co-op movement, right? I mean, we're seeing these cooperatives get built. Um, is that, do we not care about the current system? And do we just start building um, the system that we want to see from us being together as peers, planning it together? Um, um, so that, that's, how, that, that's how I would add to that. So um, first of all, thank you all. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call myself out for a second. Like I learned something today. I learned something about my own whiteness today. And I learned something about I, that I didn't know and I wasn't saying right. 
And so what I want to encourage all of us to do who are online watching this today is that we all have places where we can go and grow. And we are where we are. And the thing I learned was that as much as I think white people were the problem and made this mess, and I feel like we should really take the charge of moving it forward, I'm hearing something different from the people who might feel differently about it and have an altered opinion. And I need to listen. I need to hear. I need to absorb. I need to integrate those thoughts so that my own privilege doesn't make my answer right. So I wanna model that for you because I had that awakening moment just now. And I think it's really important that we constantly are, are chasing more knowledge, more curiosity, more engagement. So um, we could talk forever. It's pretty clear to me uh, that we can keep going for a long time, but I do know and want to be respectful of the time. So what I'd like to do, and I know so many people here are eager to know what they can do right away. Now, no one's going to go out and start dismantling the system or replacing it with a new one tomorrow. I'm pretty clear about that. Hope you guys are too. Um, but I do know that there are things that people can go and start doing right away. I would love for each of you to give one or two items that we can share with everybody. Anybody? I'll go first if I need be. Um, okay, so I said this in the live I did yesterday and I'm gonna say it until uh, the day I die. Um, white people, we need to get comfortable with the concept of white supremacy. It doesn't mean the KKK, which is a violent group of white nationalists who have tortured people for a very long time and continue to do so. It is a system, it is a structure that you've learned today advantages white people over other groups of people all the time, in every way, in every shape, constantly. And so getting comfortable with the discomfort of those words is really, really important. And you can start by educating yourself about it, reading about it, reading Debbie's book, Waking Up White. Um, you can, there are so many incredible resources just from this group of people alone um, that I wanna encourage you to embrace those words as ugly as they sound to you at the moment so that you can help become positive change around them. That's one of mine. Who else? Suzanne, I think those are great. I would say that, um... You know, we talk about allyship and um, I've tried to make like a, a little, uh, you know, a device for people to remember ally by A, being advocacy and, um, a, and also really thinking about um, amplifying people's voices. So it could be that you're in a situation where you can see that, that, that people aren't hearing someone's voice and you could be the one that amplifies it or you might see a situation that isn't right and you can be an advocate. So that's the A. The L, the other, the L is uh, listen, listen. Like I think the hardest thing to do when you're like all excited and you figured out what's going on is to actually listen. Um, because people, need, black people need to be able to tell their stories. They don't need to have you say, well, do you think that maybe if you weren't so, you didn't have that grimace on your face that maybe he would have been nicer to you? Maybe he wouldn't have killed them, whatever. Um, listen to the stories because the stories will tell you the truth. Um, and then the other L is learn. And this is to be an ally is a long-term relationship Based trust based building um, relationship type of thing, which means you've got to learn what you don't know. Um, you don't have to know everything, but you've got to start doing the self education. And then, why is really about yielding. And that is yielding in solidarity. If you want to be part of what is better for Black people, you got to let them lead you. My son, who's very, very much um, a person who is, is working for justice said to me 
during uh, the uh, the re last really horrible time we had with Eric Gardner um, in New York, and he was in a protest. And he said, "Mom, white people crack me up." I said, "What?" He goes, "They want to tell us how to be mad about the fact that we're being killed." <laughs> like, they, you know, maybe if you didn't like do this, people will respect you. Racism doesn't work like that. You can be perfect. You can follow every rule. And the ism says you're not as good. Your life is not as meaningful. So when white people try to give us suggestions about how to go, we are like, that's a great world if you can get it. But that's not my lived experience. So yield to me and what we're telling you. And that will be helpful. Don't tell us how to do this. And I think that that's just something that really helpful people have been dipped into the white culture. They, it's so hard for them to yield and they're used to taking up space. So advocate and amplify, listen, learn, and yield. We're all in this together. We need each other. Love it. Um, just a couple things first. Try to buy something from a minority business every day, once a week. Make it a point to buy the gifts that you're buying for people if you, if you're, if you buy gifts. Buy them from independent artists. Buy them from diverse artists. Buy diverse books. Um, you know, don't always buy books that reinforce your culture. Um, but, but use some of your consumer power to help you support other cultures. It's so often extractive. Again, like, you know, how can I help you? To, or... But, you know, support our communities. And then you may also come up with, with some other ideas. Um, and the last thing I'll say is when you become enlightened, the world becomes enlightened. Um, so work on your lenses, work on how you observe your behavior, work on your yoga um, in life, you know, your sadhana, what, what, whatever you, what, whatever you want to call it. But um, practice being um, love and, and light. And you probably won't get it wrong because if you treat someone with love, they'll very rarely um, take it the wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, brotherly love. They'll very rarely take it the wrong, the wrong way. Um, so those are my suggestions. Thank you so much, Malia. Yeah, I think I would say, so this whole idea of white supremacy being a system, it is a, white supremacy is an external manifestation of an internal value and belief system. And that lives in, we've all been deeply exposed to it. And so, especially if we're white, we've been rewarded for buying into it. Um, and so interrogating that's important. It's a, it's an idea, the ideology, the belief, the value comes out of the enlightenment period. And it says that all, this is a time of great science where uh, all life forms are not equal. You know, an ant is below a lion is below a human. And in the human pile, we're not all the same. At the top of that human pile is a white, elite, male, Protestant, Anglo, um, they didn't have the word for cisgender or heterosexuality back then, perhaps, able, all of that. Um, and so this idea that the human, we can place one another in a hierarchy is really, for me, it's so deeply embedded. And um, tending to that, noticing that, being compassionate and saying, is that what I really want to believe? Or did I just soak in that before I had a chance to discern as a little kid. Um, I and So that's one thing. Second thing is I have something called the uh, 21 day plan that I created with Dr. Eddie Moore Jr. Um, it's something everyone can start today, tomorrow. It's free. It lives on my website, um, debbieirving.com, Dr. Moore's website, America and more. And the third thing I would say, I honestly don't think that I would have stuck with it because it does get hard. If I hadn't told everyone, including my good friend, Renee Myers, that I was going to be writing a book, I couldn't back down. So I put myself in a corner and I had to figure out my way forward. And so I ask you to put yourself in a corner. And one way to do it is to, before you go to bed tonight, make a commitment and post it on Facebook. Um, I'm going to do this 21 day plan. I'm going to gather 10 friends in the next week to do the 21 day plan. I'm going to commit to six months of learning something, name a commitment, set a goal, and then make it public. So you have to, and ask people to hold you accountable. 
Beautiful, amazing ladies. So I'm gonna add one more and then I'll close the meeting. Um, one of the things that I find most upsetting about what happened with George Floyd is not the knee on his neck, which was the most heinous thing I've ever witnessed. It was the three other police officers standing around watching it, not stopping it. So um, please interrupt bad behavior. Interrupt someone who's being racist or someone who's treating someone poorly. Tell other people it's not okay. Um, that is what bravery and courage looks like. And this is what this work takes. So if you are seeing something on, online here on Facebook or in your local community or in your, as Brene says all the time, around the Thanksgiving dinner table, if grandma is saying something completely untoward, you can say, grandma, that's racist. We don't use those words anymore. Please start interrupting all of this bad behavior because if one of those police officers had been ballsy enough to step forward and say, hey guys, this is wrong, the whole system would have been interrupted and George Floyd's life may have been saved. So we're hoping when we had our planning call, we discussed doing this again. I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments if this was helpful and useful to you. Um, we have 2 billion other things we could be talking about. So we tried to keep it limited tonight um, to kind of the basics to get us all started together to make sure we have a baseline for where we are. If this conversation was good for you, please let us know in the comments so we know what kind of feedback we're getting and if this is something we'd like to see again. Um, I wanna end where we started. There's a reason I started my company, Dare Human. And it is because I believe that in each of us, there is an opportunity to rise way higher than we currently try to rise. And so I'm gonna start where I end, where I end where I started, which is what I truly believe, that you were, put here, you were put here for a purpose, to be the best human you can be, to share your heart and your brilliance, to build societies and companies and things that benefit, are beneficial to all people and this amazing planet we inhabit and to love as deeply and as kindly as possible. I invite you to dare human. That's what this means. Thank you all for being part of this. Um, I look forward to your comments. I will be reviewing them in the coming days. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Take care of each other. Thank you so much to these extraordinary women for giving of their hearts and their time and their brilliance. I love you all. Mwah. Good night, everybody.